and let's allons-y. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey things that we caught in the first of the new Doctor Who specials, The Star Beast. Alright, so after a very long wait, the Doctor is back, and this time, he has a familiar face. But now this face has come back. Why? After Jodie Whittaker's final episode as the 13th Doctor in 2022's The Power of the Doctor, the Doctor regenerated in the 14th Doctor, once again played by David Tennant, who previously played the 10th Doctor from 2005 to 2010, and also briefly in the 2013 50th anniversary Doctor Who special, The Day of the Doctor. Unlike most episodes of Doctor Who, The Star Beast begins with a direct address to the audience, with the Doctor basically recapping everything that's happened three Doctors ago, specifically in 2006 and 2008. The only other time contemporary Doctor Who has used this kind of direct narration catch-up to the audience was, briefly, during the American releases of Matt Smith's first season, in which a voiceover from Karen Gillan preceded the opening credits. Anyways, there are a lot of specific episode references in this opening narration. When the Doctor says, I had a best friend, we see a scene of the Doctor and Donna looking at the camera, which interestingly comes from the end of the season 4 episode, Forest of the Dead. When Donna says, Sometimes I have dreams about impossible things. We also see a dialect, but also the Spider Queen Rachnus from Donna Donna's very first episode, The Runaway Bride, in 2006. Now, as Donna talks about creatures and adventures and faraway skies, we see a Santaran from the Poison Sky, a Vashta Narada from the Silence of the Library, as well as the base for the Shadow Proclamation from the Stolen Earth. She also mentions her dreams, which give us scenes from Donna's wedding in The End of Time Part 2. A giant wasp from the Unicorn and the Wasp, a moment from the Fires of Pompeii, and the massive adipose ship from Partners in Crime. But the most relevant flashbacks here come from the Season 4 finale, which first aired in 2008's Journey's End, in which Donna absorbed the Doctor's essence, created a second Doctor on accident, and became a kind of pseudo Time Lord herself, but only for a very short time. Because of this meta crisis, Donna had to forget everything she knew. If Donna remembers the Doctor or the Time Lord power, it will overload her mind and she will die. And we get all of that in just under a minute. Now after that monologue, we get to the new opening credits and the new arrangement of the classic Ron Grainer Doctor Who theme from returning composer Murray Gold. We see the TARDIS in flight, which is an opening sequence that feels like a mashup of the 10th and 11th Doctor's eras. This episode is called The Star Beast, and in addition to showrunner Russell T. Davies as the writer, it's also attributed to Pat Mills and Dave Gibbons because they wrote the original 1980 comic strip story, The Star Beast, on which this is based. And that comic book featured an early iteration of another Dave Gibbons creation from The Watchmen, This Is Your Mom. Now back in 1980, The Star Beast was a comic strip featuring the fourth Doctor as played by Tom Baker. It was, however, never an actual episode, even though Tom Baker did an audio version in 2019. So when the TARDIS materializes at the start of this episode, we do not see the interior behind the Doctor at all. This is a slight foreshadowing of the end of the episode in which the TARDIS has a brand new interior. The Doctor meets Donna right away, then hears her shouting the name Rose. This has the Doctor worried because he thinks that she's referring to Rose Tyler, the Doctor's long-lost companion who ended up in a parallel universe in the episode Doomsday and again in Journey's End. This Rose is, of course, not Rose Tyler, but instead Donna's daughter, Rose, played by Yasmin Finney. And we later learn at the end of the episode that this Rose chose her own name, which seems to be because of her shared Time Lord memory of Rose. Now, of course, the first episode episode of the previous Russell T. Davies Doctor Who era was the 2005 episode titled Rose. We hear Murray Gold's musical cues for Donna here as the Doctor says what three times. Rose! What? Now this is the catchphrase of David Tennant's Doctor which began in the 2006 episode The Runaway Bride when he first met Donna Noble. What? What? What the hell is this place? What? As the spaceship crashes, Donna mentions to never trust a man with a goatee, which could be a reference to various incarnations of the evil Time Lord, the Master, who often rocked a goatee in the classic era. The Hadron power lines are lethal to the touch. Donna refers to Rose's great-granddad, which is the first of several references to Wilf, Donna's grandfather, who was the last person to be with the Tenth Doctor at the end of time, part two. I'd be proud. Of what? If you were my dad. Now we don't actually see Wilf in this episode, although in the middle of the episode the Doctor incorrectly thinks that Wilf has died, only to be told that Kate Stewart and Unit are taking care of him. The episode actually ends with the idea of seeing Wilf and Donna saying that she really wants her grandfather to see the Doctor one last time. Now in real life though, the actor who played Wilf, Bernard Cribbins, has passed away, but we know that he filmed scenes for these specials, he's just not on this one yet. That's it. 
Now, when the spaceship first lands, Rose notes that her mom manages to miss everything. Now, this references the alternate universe from turn left in which Donna missed several alien incursions by often just being focused on something else. Donna's ignorance of outer space events is also mentioned again a bit later in the episode when her mom pretends not to know anything about the new UFO. Donna refers to the doctor as a skinny man and says, You can wear a suit that's high up to the age of 35 and no further. Donna often called the doctor skinny back in season four, but the age joke is even funnier. David Tennant and Catherine Tate were 37 and 38 respectively way back in 2008, and today they're 52 and 53. Wow, so they're like hella old now. Well, that's very ageist, Doug, and also interesting because right now David Tennant is 52, and the very first doctor ever, William Hartnell, was 55, just three years older than Tennant is now. Bottom line, Tennant and Tate aren't old and they both look amazing. It's gorgeous! <laughs> The doctor uses his psychic paper to convince Sean Temple to let him into his taxi cab. Now, the psychic paper is an invention of the Russell T. Davies era, which began in 2005 with Christopher Eccleston's ninth doctor. Here, the psychic paper misgenders the doctor as Grand Mistress, referring to him having just been a woman, Jodie Whittaker, before regenerating, which is why the doctor says to the psychic paper, catch up. Once in the cab, the doctor says, I must be which is a bit redundant since Alonzi means let's go in French. Now, back in the 2006 to 2010 run, the 10th doctor said this all of the time. Allons-y! Allons-y! The Doctor and Sean talk about a character named Norris, a frenemy of Donna's who appeared in The Runaway Bride, as well as Donna's wedding to Sean in The End of Time Part 2. The Doctor and Sean discuss Donna giving away her winnings from a lottery ticket, which, unbeknownst to Sean, the Doctor gave to Donna's mother and grandfather in The End of Time Part 2. Here we learn that Donna gave away all of her money to charity, which later in the episode is revealed to be the result of Donna having a suppressed memory of wanting to be more like the Doctor. Now, as the Doctor sneaks around and tries to invest to get the newly landed spaceship, he busts out his latest sonic screwdriver, which has all sorts of fancy new functions, including the ability for him to draw things in the air, and later, as he's getting Donna's family to safety, also to create force fields. The doctor meets unit scientific advisor 56 Shirley Ann Bingham, to which the doctor says, I was scientific advisor number one. This references the fact that the third doctor, John Pertwee, actually worked for unit outright when he was exiled on Earth. Shirley assumes this doctor is the 10th doctor, but he surprises her when he says, One of the skinny suits. After that, I wear a bow tie. After that, I'm a Scotsman. After that, I'm a woman. This moment is the current Doctor running through all his incarnations of post-David Tennant. Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi, Jodie Whittaker, and back to David Tennant. The mystery of why the Doctor got his old face back is not fully solved in this episode. When Donna gets her memory back, she says, Why did this face come back? to say goodbye. Meanwhile, a furry creature called the Meep ends up in Rose's shed, a shed which, by the way, is filled with all sorts of bespoke toys that Rose sells online. These foreshadow the fact that Rose has inherited some memories from her mom, because we later learn that each of these creatures represents something that Donna and the Doctor encountered back in the day. Okay, so Rose is like a character from Dune now? What? No, dude, this is Doctor Who. Well, Rose has the memories of her mother, which, which she was pre-born with, and the Time Lord energy is kind of like the water alive. Doug, this is nothing like Dune, okay? So, in the next scene, the unit soldiers all get these blue eyes. The voice from the outer world. Okay, actually, high five. The sleeper has awakened. The sleeper has Awakened. Rose's next door neighbor friend is named Fudge, and although he's not on screen too much, this is a direct parallel with the original Star Beast comic strip in which Fudge helps Sharon, who is now Rose in this version, take care of the Meep. Now, big spoiler here, but the Meep is evil, even though it looks cute, which in the 1980 comic version is something the audience is clued in on earlier than they are here. In fact, in the audio version released in 2019 with Tom Baker, we hear the Meep's internal thoughts mocking the humans who think that it's helpless. Meep, Meep! I am the Meep. You can talk. Now, when the Meep comes into Donna's house, she calls it a Mad Paddington. Now, this might seem like a cute reference to that famous marmalade love and bear, but the 2014 Paddington film has two Doctor Who connections. The 12th Doctor himself, Peter Capaldi, played the scheming Mr. Curry in that movie, while Matt Lucas, one of the 12th Doctor's companions in season 10, appeared briefly as a hapless cab driver. Like the Doctor, the Meep has two hearts, and its preferred pronoun is the definite article, saying, I am always the Meep. The Doctor responds, oh, I do that, because the Doctor very much does that now and forever. I am always the duck. Okay, the duck. And after a lot of explosions and escaping, the doctor realizes that the Ruth warriors are just stunning everyone. So he invokes shadow proclamation protocols. Now this references the outer space police, which were mentioned in Rose way back in 2005 and first seen in the stolen earth in 2008. With everybody basically on trial, the doctor learns the backstory of the Meep who were once kind, but then were turned cruel by a psychedelic sun. Though in the original comic, it was a black sun. The Meep pulls out a blaster, which recreates a classic 
panel from the original comic. Now at this point, the only thing that can save all of London from being burned by the double dagger drive of the spaceship and the Meep is a team up of the Doctor Donna, which results in Donna getting her memories back even though the Doctor is sure that it's going to kill her. In a parallel to the end of time, the control room on the spaceship is divided in half, which is kind of like the Doctor and Wilf being in separate radiation booths in that episode. The Doctor complains, Why does it have to be this? is very similar to his outburst when Wilf is trapped behind glass. I could do so much more, so much more! But the Dr. Donna do manage to save the day, and we quickly learn that Donna's mind will not be burned by the Time Lord Metacrisis, because she passed on some of that energy to her child, Rose. Too much power for one person, but you had a child! So, in the end, the non-binary aspect of Rose, and in a sense the Doctor, is what allows the energy to pass safely from Donna and Rose. The Meep is arrested, but cryptically says, Just wait till I tell the boss which could possibly refer to Neil Patrick Harris as the celestial toy maker who is set to make an appearance in one of the next two episodes. In the end, the Doctor and Donna head into the TARDIS for one last trip, only to discover that it's much bigger on the inside than it ever was before. Not only is this the most expansive TARDIS set since the 1996 TV movie, but it's also the most accessible one too, complete with a ton of awesome ramps. Donna tells the Doctor that she lost her last job by dropping coffee on a computer, and then she drops coffee on the TARDIS and everything goes haywire. The TARDIS often gets derailed by minor things, like this. Even in the 2020 kids book, Doctor Who and the Runaway TARDIS, a peanut butter sandwich jammed in the console sent it out of control. As the TARDIS disappears, we hear the chiming of the cloister bell, which has often heralded extreme danger or temporal paradoxes throughout the modern era of Who, perhaps most notably at the end of Turn Left, when the Doctor realized parallel universes were possibly colliding. The Doctor says, We can end up anywhere in time and space! Which is, in many ways, exactly how this whole thing got started way back with William Hartnell and an out of control TARDIS in the very first episode ever an unearthly child. And so, with the first 60th anniversary Doctor Who special, the adventure has now come full circle. Well guys, that's all the easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let us know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.